Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. It's the end of the year, so why not? This is going to be a no-edit special. I've, I've tried starting this story several times, <laughs> but because of some confusion with the facts, I keep screwing it up, and I've decided I just hit start again, and I ain't going to make any edits. Mark my words. Story sent to me by a lot of people out of Texas. Brian New wrote this version of it for CBS DFW or 1121. North Texas teen pays salesman $10,000 for used SUV. Then dealership repossesses it. A Fort Worth teenager had a vehicle he believed he purchased repossessed by a Fort Worth used car dealership. You'll notice he believed he purchased it. You see where this is going, right? Five months after a 16-year-old young man paid a part-time salesman nearly $10,000 for a compact SUV, the vehicle was towed back to the Fort Worth dealership, and the used car dealership said that the Mazda was theirs, and they were unaware that a former part-time salesman had sold the vehicle. So the dealership is actually saying, yeah, we got cars on our lot, we got salesmen roaming around out there, and if you buy a car from one of them, it might not be good because we might not know about it. These things happen. Uh, the young man paid the salesman directly for the vehicle because the salesman told the teenager and his grandfather that the car was his personal vehicle. So they're shopping. The kid and his grandfather are shopping for cars, walking around a used car lot in Texas. Salesman walks up and says, can I help you? They go look at stuff. They can't find anything. Finally, the salesman goes, look, I'll sell you my own car. Here we go. This is my own car. I just, I just happen to be here. There's my car. I feel like selling it. You can buy my personal vehicle from me. Now, the manager of the dealership now says that they did, in fact, sell that SUV to the salesman a few months earlier, but the salesman had stopped making payments on it, so the dealership repossessed it. So they are saying they repossessed the vehicle from their own salesman, and the vehicle is now on their lot, and the salesman still works there, part-time. The dealership said the salesman was working as a freelance salesman the day the Fredericks came in, but the manager said he was unaware that the salesman had sold them the Mazda. So apparently, besides having part-time salespeople, they've got freelance salespeople who are wandering around the lot doing whatever the heck it is they do, but they're freelance. The salesman told the TV station that he did, in fact, own the Mazda because of a prior business deal with the dealership. Now, the dealership and the salesman dispute who owns the vehicle, but the problem is that the kid doesn't have his vehicle and he's out 10 grand. So he goes to the dealership, finds a car he likes, salesman says, you can buy it, but it's mine, give me the money. Kid gives him the money, takes the car, and now the dealership repossesses the car. Dealership's got their car back, it's been repossessed twice. The salesman apparently had no authority to sell it because it wasn't his car to sell, and the kid's out 10 grand. He said, I worked at Chick-fil-A for about a year saving up for that car. That's the most frustrating part is how long I worked saving up for it. When he turned 16, he and his grandfather had gone looking for a vehicle at that dealership. And after not finding what they were looking for, the salesman showed them his 2016 Mazda CX-5. The kid said it looked great. It was super clean, nice, and pretty new. So I was like, let's go for it. When they went to write the check, the salesman said, It was a personal car. It's my car. Make the check out to me. So they made the check out to him. It was for $9,893. It was a cashier's check, apparently. And they made it out to the seller, who was the salesman. Now, the kid and his grandfather said the salesman gave them a bill of sale uh, and told them he would send them the vehicle's title. And the grandfather said, you know, I believed him. The salesman was the nicest man, and I guess that's how you get in this kind of trouble. Five months later, uh, the kid was out shopping when he walked out and saw his vehicle being towed. Uh, We stopped the tow truck guy and we started talking to him. We were like, this is my car. It didn't make sense because I paid cash. So in other words, he he, he didn't miss any payments. There was one payment, one payment of the $9,800 and change that he made. So you can't repossess the car. He paid cash for it. Well, the salesman now tells the uh, TV station, I sold the car on good intentions. It was going to be his car, and I was perfectly willing to sign up the title as soon as I got it. All this other stuff is ridiculous. So the salesman is now saying he thought it was his car. (laughs) The salesman said because of prior business deals with that dealership, the Mazda was already paid off. 
He said he was just waiting for the dealership to give him the title so he could give it to the Fredericks. Now, when the TV station asked the salesman in an interview if he had any records showing he had paid off the vehicle, his attorney interrupted and then said they were not going to get into specifics about the case. Then why are you on television? <laughs> why are you in front of a camera? <laughs> we're here to answer questions about the case. We just can't go into any specifics about the case. The salesman told the TV station that he filed for bankruptcy before the dealership repossessed the car and notified the dealership the vehicle was a protected asset. In that case, you probably can't sell it either because the court will tell you what you can and cannot do with your assets at that time. He then said, I'm just trying to make it right as best I can. Uh, meanwhile, in 2008, the salesman was sentenced to a year in jail after pleading guilty to felony debit card abuse and theft by check. Prior to that, he'd been convicted four other times for white-collar crimes, including deceptive trade practice and forgery. So this is the kind of guy you want on your lot as a freelance part-time salesman. Uh, salesman said that was 10 years ago. Since then, I've been doing nothing but trying to make my life better and to better people around me. Everybody has a past. I can't change my past. All I can do is do what I do now. That's pretty true for everybody. While both the salesman and the dealership told the investigative team at the TV station they are doing whatever they can to make it right, the Mazda that the kid paid for still sits locked up at the dealership. Uh, the kid says, I just hope this doesn't happen again to anyone else because it's such a frustrating experience. You know, my hat's off to the kid. He's taking this very well. I, I, you know, I hope it doesn't happen to anyone else. Um, I, I'd be frightened to know what I would have said if this had happened to me when I was 16 and a TV station put a camera in my face and said, what do you think? <laughs> uh, when buying a car through a private sale, the TV station points out, the seller should be able to show you the title and the seller should be listed as the owner and the only owner. There should be no financing company listed. And if the seller has financed the car with a third party uh, and hasn't paid off the loan, that should be a red flag. But here is the problem. And the problem is that when you go to a car dealership, Car dealerships are regulated by the states in which they work, and there are laws they're required to abide by. Now, Carvana, for instance, seems to have trouble with this uh, from time to time, and we won't talk about them, and I know people are going to jump on me not mentioning Carvana if I hadn't mentioned them. But a traditional car dealership, just Steve's used car lot at the corner of Maine and Elm. Steve's used car lot, okay? You come in there, I'm Steve. I've got a car lot. I got a lot of cars on my lot. And you come in there and you say, Steve, I want to buy a car. I go, this is your lucky day. I want to sell a car. And I want to sell it to you. What's it going to take to put you in this car today? We walk the lot. I show you a car. You drive the car. You kick the tires. You drive it around. You slam the doors. I go, dude, stop slamming the doors. Stop kicking the tires. But you buy the car anyway. You, you buy the car. So you come inside. We sit down at a desk. We do a bunch of paperwork. Most people... When they're in a dealership, because they know the dealerships are regulated to some extent, aren't they? That you don't sit there and go, show me the title. I want to see the title. Show me this. Show me that. Most people aren't even aware what documents they need to sign. I spoke to somebody who dropped a car off at the end of a lease last week. And I said, what paperwork did you sign? What paperwork? No, that's what I'm asking you. What paperwork did you sign? Didn't sign any paperwork. No, not even an odometer disclosure statement as required by federal law. See, there are documents that must be signed and must exist at the time that you sit down and do that sale. So I don't fault the grandfather and the 16-year-old kid for believing the salesman who's walking around the lot who says, oh, I have the authority to sell cars here. And by the way, I have my own car. I can sell it to you because you know I just want to make a sale. It's a little unorthodox, but you might think, well, if the guy can sell us the car, maybe he got a great deal on it. Maybe he's going to make some money, but it's a good price for the car. I don't know if that's a good price for the car, but I'm just talking here. So, which is pretty much the case in all my videos. I'm just talking here. But the point is that when you're at the dealership, you expect that they're going to follow the law because they've got a license to sell cars, which could be in jeopardy if they do things wrong. Now, I don't know how things are run in Texas where they have freelance, part-time salesmen roaming their lot. <laughs> Never heard of that before. But suffice it to say 
that if you go to a car dealership, there's going to be a whole bunch of documents that you have to sign. And it's very mundane. I even did a video a couple of years ago when I bought my most recent vehicle. And I did a video called All the Documents I Had to Sign When I Bought My New Vehicle. And I showed them all one at a time and explained what they were. And it's a stack of documents. But all of those documents serve specific purposes. And at the very least, if you're buying a vehicle in a typical arm's length transaction, not at Steve's used cars, but at a you know, end of a driveway in your neighborhood, somebody selling a car. You do want to see the title because the title will show who owns the car and if there's any liens on the car. So you want there to be a congruence between the name on the title and the person you're buying the car from, number one. But number two, you want to make sure there's no liens on the title so no one else has a claim against that car that might be something that this person can't deal with. So if you meet a person and they go, yes, I own this car. Here's a title. I own it free and clear. My name here, no lien holder. And they show you ID that that's who they are. Boom, you're good to go. You can buy the car from that person. But at car dealerships, a lot of people assume paperwork's being done by them. They know what they're doing. If I hand them the money, they hand me the keys. It's my car. And most people know that the dealership takes paperwork, submits it to the state, and the state will often send the title to you if it's a state where you get to do that. Especially if there's no lien on the car, they'll send the title to you. And, you know, that's what happens. So in this case, it sounds like an odd transaction. But, but here's what's going to happen if I had to predict. The dealership is going to probably be on the hook for this because they have the liability as the principal for the agents who act on their behalf. And if they've got people roaming their lots who are freelancers or part-timers or uh, I don't know what else you want to call them, those people are their sales agents. They are their agents. And the principal is a dealership. And they're responsible for what those agents do, especially if they're doing what they're supposed to, which is selling cars. So it's an unusual situation. Uh, I'm shocked that the dealership is putting up a fight on this one, but crazier things have happened. And especially in this day and age, I can see where somebody might think, hey, I'm buying a car from an individual. He hasn't got the title yet because everyone's heard of stories about slow titles these days. The states are shorthanded and the offices that handle the titles and the mail system is all bets are off. That's what I like to call it. So somebody you're buying a car from could say, I haven't got the title yet. What you should do at that point, however, is step back and say, until I see a title, I can't buy this car. However, on a dealership lot, uh, if you had to stop buying cars because you couldn't see the titles, Carvana would be out of business. Okay, so (laughs) I know this story's got nothing to do with Carvana, but they are the ones who keep making headlines about their inability to deliver the physical titles of cars to people they've sold vehicles to. So there you go. I made the entire video with no edits. It'll save me three minutes this morning. Uh, CBS DFW 1121 ran the story. Brian New wrote it. North Texas teen pays salesman $10,000 for used SUV, then dealership repossesses it. And now they're fighting over whether or not he actually bought that car or the salesman had the right to sell it, being a freelance part-timer, as he was. Thanks to all the people who sent me the story, David, Keith, Justin, Steve, not me, Drew, Craig, Jonathan, and Donald. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate the help, as I always do. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. What I'm looking for is a blessing that's not in disguise.